Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Terry G and Steven JL. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. First up today, some people were getting excited because of this flyer for the LA Auto Show later this year in November that has a car that resembles the Roadster, thinking maybe we're going to get a final production version. It's possible, but I would just say personally, I won't be surprised if the Roadster gets pushed back until 2024. When it comes to 4680 production, I really do think that the semi and Cybertruck should be prioritized over the Roadster when it comes to products coming out next year. Those vehicles are just more in line with Tesla's mission. And don't forget, Tesla could make basically three Model Ys if you assume a 70 kilowatt hour battery pack with the 4680s compared to maybe one Roadster if that battery pack size is around 200 kilowatt hours. I wanted to point something out with the latest Hertz update and how it's so far really liking Tesla's being in the fleet, lower maintenance costs, and customers are enjoying the Tesla EV experience, which is being expressed in NPS net promoter scores that are 10 points higher than our global average. That net promoter score is just the likelihood that customer would recommend the brand. So Hertz and their customers so far loving the Tesla experience. However, after reading through some Reddit comments, things can actually improve quite a bit from a customer experience perspective. This user currently has a Tesla from Hertz and said not being able to use your phone as a key, no app connectivity for climate, charging, etc., no premium connectivity, no sentry due to no USB included, and no glove box access are all kind of frustrating issues. Other users were saying the glove box access is currently pin restricted, but I would imagine if you reached out to Hertz and specifically asked for it, they should be able to grant you access. I would imagine that with time, Tesla will have a rental mode option for people to have temporary phone keys and to have more access via the mobile app for for these rental services. So things are already going well, but they can get even better. Look, we, we're, uh, as a regulator, we call balls and strikes and, and, and we, uh, we, we regulate companies to make sure that they're compliant with the laws. We don't uh, cheer for one company over another. Tesla is the largest producer of, of EVs in the country. They've played a, a remarkable role in uh, propelling EV revolution. Uh, there are many companies that are, that are doing remarkable work. Uh, and again, my primary role uh, is just to make sure that every auto uh, auto that, that hits the road, no matter who made it, is safe uh, and, and complies with our safety expectations. And then more broadly to work private sector to ensure that this is a made in America EV revolution. That segment aired later last month, but it's good to hear Tesla get some recognition from this administration. Now, to the point on not rooting for any specific company, I know they can't play favorites, at least not publicly. However, they had no problem rooting for GM as leading the EV revolution not too long ago. Ray for Tesla reported that CATL is set to provide Tesla with a new type of LFP battery named the M3P. This will be a 72 kilowatt hour pack going into the Model Y starting either later this year or early next. To be clear, Calvin Yang was reporting the same news and he was saying it's actually going to be an iron phosphate manganese type battery, which are supposed to be superior to the regular LFP, just the iron phosphate. However, after doing some digging, CATL's M3P is actually different than this lithium iron manganese phosphate battery. CATL definitely plays its cards close to its chest, but here's what I could find. With this new M3P tech, it's similar to the improved LFP battery chemistry with added manganese, what Kelvin Yang was saying, those so-called LMFP packs. However, CATL insists this new technology, the M3P, is different and proprietary. Insider sources have revealed the cells have higher energy density than the LMFP batteries while providing similar longevity and charging speed improvements. Reportedly, the production costs are actually on par with the LFP chemistry. So all of these improvements, but from a cost perspective, on par with regular LFP. These M3P batteries don't just replace iron with manganese in certain places, but also throws other metals like zinc or aluminum into the mix. As a result, the energy density of M3P batteries is about 15% higher than that of lithium iron phosphate, regular LFP, 
reaching 210 watt hours per kilogram, and the cost is comparable to that of LFP. Previously, CATL's chief scientist said that this new M3P tech will be aimed at vehicles with 700 kilometer or 435 miles of range. Now, it was not designated which cycle this would be on, presumably for the EPA. It would be significantly lower, somewhere in the threes. However, this would be a pretty big step forward. Was also able to find this. A source from Tesla said that lithium manganese iron phosphate batteries are also being researched within Tesla itself. But remember, this M3P tech is differentiated from both LFP and LFMP. The cathode material of CATL's M3P battery consists of ternary lithium materials like zinc or aluminum and lithium manganese iron phosphate materials as well. Just to check multiple sources going back to July, another article saying CATL says it's developing the M3P different than the LMFP. In January of this year, Jordan asked Elon specifically about manganese and he said, just that manganese is an alternative to iron and phosphorus for scaling cathode production to several terawatt hours per year. Manganese also requires less lithium as it operates at higher voltage. The big disconnect in the battery space right now is that the consumers are focused on energy density and range, while Elon and team are focused on simplicity and scaling. So don't forget all of these improvements and iterations in these battery technologies, it doesn't have to result in more range for the consumer. It could just be Tesla making the choice to put less cells in the car, which leads to lower manufacturing costs, lower cost of goods sold, and more profit for Tesla. But it's not like Tesla's being greedy, they just want more cars on the road as fast as possible. The best way to do that is to use as few cells as possible. Adam Jonas put out a new note on Tesla stock. The whole thing was just talking about Tesla's risk in relying on China. The reality is the entire EV industry is currently reliant on China. More on that later in this video. However, I just wanna point out this one line. He said, for those that argue as many did at a dinner I attended last night, Tesla is overvalued as an auto company, there is merit to that argument. But the company may be substantially undervalued in other ways that deserve exploration. We believe events over the past six weeks and catalysts over the next six months will materially shift the narrative around what Tesla does, the markets they address, the growth profile, and the global strategic implications of the ecosystem on which they sit atop. There is a time coming when this paradigm shift will happen and people start to see Tesla as this massive conglomerate of many different startups, not the least of which is this behemoth of an energy company. Now, I'm not necessarily confident this paradigm shift will happen in a mainstream scale in the next six months. However, with the focus on energy security and the global situation, more and more people every month will realize the importance of Tesla to our future. And if Tesla can ever figure this one out, then that means even better things. But apparently Tesla is testing Solar Roof version 3.5 up from the latest version before this, version three. Electric has some sources saying that it's now testing this version 3.5 on employees' homes ahead of a wider launch, maybe later this year. As of late, it's basically just been bad news for the solar roof that Tesla was only installing around 23 solar roofs per week. They had recently paused all installations in United States markets. The third party installers were continuing on, but Tesla itself put a pause on its installations. Essentially, things with the solar roof just have not been going well. Now, is this version 3.5 going to be an overnight fix? Absolutely not. However, it's encouraging to hear that they're continually working on the hardware and maybe they have a fix that will make installations a bit easier. Electrek is saying Tesla is aiming for its own solar roof installation to continue in the fourth quarter of this year, presumably with this new version 3.5. Unfortunately, there was no detail given on what version 3.5 actually entails. This right here is great news for multiple reasons. Tesla Audrey on Twitter sharing Model S and X Plaid prices and estimated delivery dates are back for Europe. Deliveries will start in December later this year. Now, so far it is just the Plaid that's available. The long range for the S and the X says available in 2023. I believe Tesla stopped taking orders for these vehicles outside of North America toward the end of last year, but in terms of actual SNX deliveries to parts of Europe, I think it's been closer to two years. I personally would take this as a strong sign that Tesla is feeling confident about its SNX production rates at the moment. As we should have guessed, right now many automakers are scrambling to get with policymakers to try to work in some new changes to 
these new EV tax credits. So far, much of the pushback is coming from the sourcing requirements dealing with battery components and battery minerals. On this point though, Manchin has little interest in changing his tune. He's telling automakers to get aggressive and make sure that we're extracting in North America, we're processing in North America, and we put a line on China. I don't believe we should be building a transportation mode on the backs of foreign supply chains. I'm not going to do it. Look, I absolutely love the hardline stance on this. I think this is critical for America's future. I absolutely believe we should try to be less reliant on China. The problem is right now, there is just not enough refining capacity here in America for the key battery components. This throws into question who will have access to these EV credits at all, because most automakers are not going to be meeting these requirements as soon as the next two or three years. Remember that most estimates have China refining somewhere around 75 to 90% of the world's ultimate EV battery lithium supply. Automakers are saying privately the percentage targets for critical minerals and battery component sourcing are too high and rise too quickly. This is a separate article and basically industry insiders are referring to these EV tax credits as more of a sourcing bill than actually being about the consumer. The CEO of Autos Drive America said, it's about bringing those resources and the mining and the processing either back to North America or with our partners in free trade agreements. The latest reporting from Bloomberg on the topic, so far automakers aren't making much headway. Senators are unwilling to consider any substantial changes that would upset support for the bill. Companies like Ford, GM, Toyota, and Stellantis are lobbying to extend the start of those requirements by multiple years. It might sound crazy, but on this one, I'm inclined to agree. It just seems like when you only consider America and the countries we have free trade agreements with, Right now, there's just not enough refining capacity to source enough battery minerals and components for all of the EVs that need to be produced. Of course, creating that capacity here in America has to be the priority. I just don't know how fast those targets are actually reasonable. Monroe Live released another new video on the 4680 structural pack teardown and listen to what they said. Even though the previous Model 3 and Model Y had 4,416 cells, this says how many? 828? Is that what we... 828. 828 cells. But Antonio did mumble something under his breath after saying 828, like that's what we're going with. So I wouldn't say this is 100%, but it feels like we're 99% to 828 cells. So... Let's roll with that for now. 828 cells times 96 watt hours per cell. This from the limiting factor teardown that they did, that would give us a 79.5 kilowatt hour pack. Now remember, those watt hour estimates from Jordan, these are nothing to hang our hat on. His 96 to 99 watt hour per cell figures were not based on cycling tests, they were just estimates. So given that, if we allow a 5% variance, given that information to the downside, that would be 4.8 watt hours per cell less, or around 91.2 watt hours per cell, after that level of variance. Doing the updated math, that would then put us at a 75.5 kilowatt hour pack. Then from here, if we just assume that Tesla has a 10% buffer, it's brand new technology in the 4680 structural pack, it wants to be safe. Doing that 10% buffer math, with the original estimate, that would be eight kilowatt hours. After allowing for that variance from the limiting factors estimates, that would be 7.5 kilowatt hours. And after subtracting these buffers from their respective starting points, that would put the usable capacity of this pack between 68 and 72 kilowatt hours, exactly in line with what we've seen in the real world tests, specifically from the YouTube channel Spoken Reviews. In a recent video, he actually did say that that 50D badging that we had seen originally was removed and now in the software, it just says dual motor. Of course, the biggest questions out there are there any dummy cells and is this pack software limited when it comes to the range? Now, maybe there are a few dummy cells, but for me, this math fits the bill and makes sense without any dummy cells. And I would stand by my source in saying that yes, the charging curve is software limited, but there is no magical range unlock where you're about to get 500 miles of range. This math checks out if Tesla has around a 10% energy buffer for actual usability of this new pack. 
Hopefully Monroe can actually run some capacity tests on these cells. They actually referred to the pink stuff as the pink urethane foam of death, the PUFD, which we can now refer to it as that. Antonio said these new 4680s are a major step up from a volumetric and gravimetric energy density perspective when compared to the 2170s. And in the comments of the video, Monroe actually said this was the single most expensive component deconstruction Monroe has ever done. Also, if you ever see the acronym BMB, it just stands for Battery Management Board. FCA has finally been sentenced after a three-year investigation, and they're set to pay $300 million to settle this diesel emissions fraud probe. This was a cool chart from Axios. I will link it below. You can hover and it'll tell you the percent of EVs that are in each different state. So California is number one with 38.9% of the United States EV market. So you can see that a majority of the United States EV movement is being led by a handful of states, many of which still have basically 0% of the EV market. GM is set to double the size of the Super Cruise network to over 400,000 miles of roadways and will soon be available to over 20 GM models. I always love these sliding charts. So this is pre-expansion, the roadways where Super Cruise is available, and this will be what it looks like after, before, and after. GM is set to prepay Livent Corp $198 million for a guaranteed six year supply of lithium. According to Livent's chief exec, by making the advance payment, they're clearly giving us the commitment that we're looking for. Livent produces lithium in Argentina, but it does have processing in the United States, and this supply is set to start for GM in 2025. That'll do it for today. Please take a second to like the video if you did. Hope you guys have a wonderful day, and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.